Well, hello everyone, welcome, and thank you for participating in this virtual conversation today. Before we begin, uh, we're providing Spanish translation and ASL, which can be turned on by clicking the interpretation button from the Zoom controls. I'm gonna hand it over to our Spanish interpreter to say that in Spanish. Si desean escuchar la conversación en español, por favor, busquen la opción de idioma haciendo clic en español en el símbolo del mundo en la barra de herramientas de Zoom. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you all. Uh, I'm Nick Melvoin, and I'm the LA Unified Board Member for District 4, which spans from Westchester to the Northwest, Northwest Valley and from West LA to East Hollywood. I'm excited to be co-hosting this town hall with my new colleague, Tanya Ortiz Franklin, who I'll introduce in just a minute or two. Since last March, we have been hosting a series of virtual town halls addressing topics related to school closures, distance learning, our new community of schools model, the social emotional health of our students and families, and all things COVID related. You can um, find the recordings of our town hall uh, on my website, boardmembermelvoin.com or on our Facebook page. Um, some quick housekeeping before we jump in. Uh, today's conversation about safe steps for safe, for safe schools. Uh, this conversation is being recorded and the video will be available for anyone that wants to refer to it afterwards or just wants to watch it again and again uh, on our website or on Facebook. Um, if you'd like re the recording in a different language, please reach out and we hope to be able to accommodate. Thanks to the many of you who submitted questions in advance. We'll also be monitoring questions in the Q&A. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but we may not have time to address all of your questions this evening. We have over 700 people on uh, and counting. Um, so if we don't get to your question, you know, please feel free to email either of our offices, but you can email me at bd4info at lusd.net and we will get back to you. Um, we're also going to post links in the Zoom chat uh, as resources are discussed. So the purpose of this afternoon's town hall is to provide transparent information about the district's effort to support distance learning and to reopen our schools for in-person instruction by reviewing our safe steps to safe schools plan. We wanna keep the presentation from the superintendent and his team to just about 20 minutes. So we have ample time for questions and answers. We know that it is hard for our students, our families and our staff to navigate distance learning and have been pushing since last spring for the requisite support to safely reopen our schools. Many of you have reached out to my office to understand what efforts the district is undertaking and to express your valid frustrations with the pace of reopening and the logistics of the planning efforts. And it's for this very reason that board member Ortiz Franklin and I asked our superintendent and his team to join us here this afternoon to discuss the district's reopening efforts. I wanna make sure we're setting realistic expectations for the town hall. Uh, many of you want to know, understandably, the precise days schools will reopen and exactly what that's going to look like. And please know that not just in LA, but around the country and the world, as I'm sure you know, uh, this is a work in progress. And there are many factors that are out of LA Unified's control. And so what you'll learn tonight is that the district is moving forward on all fronts to plan for the eventual reopening of our schools. Um, so it's my pleasure to, to briefly uh, introduce uh, my new colleague on the board in District 7, Tanya Ortiz Franklin, to say a few words, and then I'll introduce our superintendent and go from there. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks so much for inviting us to co-host, Nick, and thank you seriously to everyone for joining this town hall this afternoon. I'm Tanya Ortiz Franklin, your newest school board member for LA Unified, just having been sworn in on December 15th. And I am so proud to represent District 7, where I was an LA Unified student, an LA Unified teacher, and teacher educator. And District 7 spans the diverse communities of South LA, Watts, Gardena, Carson, Lomita, Harbor City, Wilmington, and San Pedro. As diverse as our communities are, so too are our needs and our opinions about school reopening. So tonight I really wanna invite you to hold compassion and empathy towards those experiencing this pandemic differently from the way you and your family might be experiencing it. And simultaneously, please hold us, your elected officials, your district leaders accountable to maintaining and providing a high quality education for all of our students. Thanks again, Nick, for having me and I'll turn it back to you to introduce our superintendent. Thank you, board member Ortiz Franklin. And it's been a pleasure having you 
on our board the last uh, couple months. Um, so we will uh, cover many of your questions during the presentation by Superintendent Buhner and his team. And then again, the question, question and answer portion after. We also plan to wrap up by 5 p.m. since we know everyone is busy and we wanna be respectful of your time. So I will now introduce our superintendent, Austin Buhner. I wanna thank um, Austin for taking the time today and for his work to help us navigate a path forward um, to provide distance learning and to reopen our schools uh, when it's safe to do so. LA Unified is led on providing a social safety net, helping to address the digital divide, lead on school-based COVID testing and soon vaccine distribution. And today we'll focus on our push to provide our students with a safe option to return to school. So with that, I will turn it over to Superintendent Butner. Am I on? There we go. Thank you, Board Member Melvoy, and thank you, Board Member Ortiz Franklin, for convening the community in this fashion. We always welcome the opportunity to uh, share what we're up to and to hear concerns and questions from the community that we serve. Uh, let me start, which is the place I, I start any conversation in these days, by hoping that everyone who is part of this conversation is safe and well uh, in these most difficult times. That's where we all have to begin. So I hope everybody in this call and their families are, are safe and well. Uh, we'll talk today about returning to schools as soon as possible and as safely as possible. Uh, that is our goal and that has been our objective throughout. Uh, my colleagues will take you through a bit of our plans. Uh, uh, suffice it to say, we're going to go through the short version. We can uh, spend as much time on any of the issues as each of you wish. Uh, and I would just summarize by saying we are ready. Uh, we have changed the air filtration systems in 89 square feet of buildings. Uh, we clean and sanitize surfaces in every room in every school every day. Uh, we have masking and protocols and training of staff to be able to welcome students back as soon as possible, as safely as possible. Uh, but unfortunately, there are things beyond our control, and it starts at the moment with a level of the virus in the communities we serve, which is somewhere between five and seven times even the new proposed standard uh, the state has uh, put in draft guidelines for the safe reopening of schools. That is the province of public health authorities, state and local. And, and if there is one imperative that has to happen is the reduction of COVID in the uh, levels of COVID in the communities that we serve. We'll also talk a little bit about, uh, after my colleagues present about what else the state can do to help accelerate uh, the opening of schools, in including providing a clear and consistent state standard, uh, standards which change seemingly by week, or with that are not uh, clear to all or well communicated will not build the trust that we all need to return our children to schools or for our colleagues to go back to work in the classroom. And the last, just to echo uh, the point board member Melvoin said is we will continue to be the safety net that our communities need. And we will cross sometime probably next week, a hundred million meals provided to the communities we serve, uh, children and adults, no questions asked. That is the largest food relief effort in the nation's history, I believe, certainly the largest ever by a single organization. It's worth noting, we did that because it's the right thing we did it because we're in a position to help, but it's also worth noting we have yet to receive a nickel of support from the state or local agencies in theory who are better placed or whose responsibility it is to assist us with that. Uh, we are providing free COVID testing for students, staff, and any of their family members at schools. That is helping keep the community safer now, but as important, it provides us with the information and the tools we need to maintain a safe school environment when we return. We're also using the same information system to schedule the appointments that will come with students back to classrooms and the same information system we can use, we hope to provide vaccinations to the school community as well as to the staff who work in schools. Uh, we'll get into the details. And so with that, it's my, Pleasure really to introduce two of my colleagues who have been working. Uh, I'll, I'll say around the clock, but that's only 24 hours. They're working more than 24 hours, so I don't know what more than around the clock is. Uh, but Dr. David Baca, who is our chief schools officer, which means his job is to make sure we're providing the direct support to a school. Uh, and Mike Romero, who is one of our local district superintendents from the south, uh, and his job is to make sure schools are delivering on the promise to students and their families. So you you have the center doing all it can to support a school and you have someone who 
is responsible for a group of schools and making sure that the needs of families and the needs of students are met. But uh, Mike has been uh, temporarily pulled from his assignment in local district south to help me and the leadership team in preparing our back to school response uh, alongside uh, Dr. Baca. So with that, uh, David or Mike, I'm not sure who's first, but uh, welcome. And again, on behalf of all of us, you know, the unsung heroes, uh, we know that teachers are working as hard as they can. You know, families to support their children are working as hard as they can. We have a group of dedicated administrators who have been working as hard as they can uh, to support students and families and those who work in school. So Mike and David, thank you for your work and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Superintendent Butner. Thank you, Board Member Melvoin and Board Member Ortiz Franklin. Greetings, BD4, BD7 constituents, families from these board districts and beyond. I am David. I have the pleasure of serving Los Angeles Unified as Chief of Schools. I have been working on reopening since April. So that means like you, I am impatient as all get out. I am feeling the urgency that uh, board member Melvoin spoke to. I'm feeling the empathy that board member Ortiz Franklin spoke to and our superintendent. We begin with well wishes to you and your family. And we recognize that um, Families have been impacted so incredibly by the pandemic and that it has been a disproportionate impact to communities of color, to our low income communities, our Latinx families, our African American families. When we started zeroing in on the uh, average adjusted case rate um, in LA County, because that was part of the new tiered system, uh, in late August, we were at 12.9 per 100K. Um, we were aiming for seven. That's what we were aiming for, and we thought we were going to get there in no time. As of last Tuesday, um, we're at 75, 75.3, still aiming for seven uh, to exit tier one, again, for that average adjusted case rate per 100,000 people. That is how we enter this conversation. I say that uh, feeling the weight of that. That said, uh, if we could head to the first slide, we are incredibly proud of the work uh, that has gone on. Superintendent spoke to the safety net. When you look at the numbers, it's astounding. When you look at an individual family um, getting food for their children, it's heartbreaking and encouraging all at the same time. Learning needs computers and internet access um, for 500,000 students. The scramble, the place we were in in spring to really beat everyone to the front of the line to be able to give devices to our students. We're in a much different place now. Next, of course, the COVID-19 testing and contact tracing at, at 42 sites, it's unprecedented as we look across the nation. And I'll say, um, and this will come up again later as we discuss online instruction, doing the very best we possibly can right now. Um, we are working hard to leverage all lessons learned thus far to do the very best we can for every single student. With that, um, let's head down that safe steps to a smooth school reopening. The next slide touches on a few key pieces Again, I really spoke to the level of COVID-19 in our communities right now. It's important to note, again, it changes based on different places in our district. Pacoima, certain places being an epicenter and it being a very different reality. Given that, we need those clear and consistent state standards of what constitutes a safe school environment, not a patchwork. In terms of vaccinations for school staff, school staff, we've heard from educators, put me in coach, get me the vaccine, get me in there. I want to be back in the classroom. That's where I know how to thrive. That's where I know students need me. So we see this as imperative. Next slide, please. We also believe we're uniquely positioned to provide vaccinations uh, to school staff and to the community at large. I know many of you have already 
likely signed up and had a COVID-19 test at one of our, our sites. I did it. I was amazed. I was in, out, the incredible efficiency, professionalism, the systems that have been set up. We believe we could leverage all of that to be able to get the vaccines out where they're needed most. So we did want to just mark that. As we do our research on community assets, community needs, the number of pharmacies, the number of fire stations, the number of places we know can't match our coverage across all communities in Los Angeles Unified. So with that next slide, please. You'll see this push. Of course, we all know our teachers are essential frontline workers. We know that not all students are thriving as much as they can with distance learning and we need to get students back. This is all students, but it is particular student groups um, need different supports. We'll talk about that throughout as well as some progress um, with all of our partners. Um, of course, we don't need to say the benefits for kids or for families, all of you know, that's why you took the time to log in, find out the latest information about where we're gonna be at this spring, this summer and looking to fall. With that, I'll lead us in more formally, next slide please, to our safe steps to safe schools and this easy as one, two, three pieces. Number one, committing to healthy behaviors. You can imagine everything we're doing now as we bring students back to campus, it is gonna be constant reinforcement, reteaching of those healthy behaviors, wearing a mask, social distancing, hand sanitization as frequently as possible. We have some hot off the press new information we're excited to share with you, new preparation efforts around a daily pass and using the daily pass, we'll dig in there. And last, of course, the, the step, getting tested for COVID-19, knowing where we're at in the community and being able to prepare for that safe return. Next slide, please. We are going to show a quick video. It's under a minute. Um, that outlines the safe steps to safe schools. In order to eventually return to the classroom, we all need to follow these safe steps to safe schools. One. Commit to healthy behaviors like wearing your mask, staying socially distant, and washing your hands. Two, use the new Daily Pass. The Daily Pass is a web tool used to schedule COVID-19 tests and get test results. It is also where you can answer the daily health check questions required to eventually get back onto a campus. Three, take your COVID-19 test at a Los Angeles Unified Testing Site. To schedule your test, go to dailypass.lausd.net. If we all take these safe steps, together we can help stop the spread of COVID-19 and get back to school. Thanks so much. I promised it was a, a brief presentation. Next slide. We'll just zero in again. Oh my God. On some of these healthy behaviors. Give us just a moment, please. What you'll see is, of course, an example of a sign that we'll see at our schools. It'll be important to reinforce our healthy behaviors as much as possible. This will be stickers in the hallway. This will be posters, signs as folks are entering. So as we get to that PowerPoint, um, you'll see some of those key pieces starting every day with screening, sanitizing frequently, practicing social distancing, Etc. Give us just a moment to get this PowerPoint back up. Never a dull moment and always ready. Um, in a moment, once we get it up, I'm going to turn it over. Perfect. We're in the right spot. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Local District South Superintendent Mike Romero, who has been leading a, a mighty team. Uh, he's going to outline daily pass. So with that, Superintendent Romero. Sure. Thank you, David. And good afternoon, families and stakeholders and Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you so much. I wanted to come back to Daily Pass. You, you learned about it in the video, but it is a tool that we're gonna to be using as part of our Safe Steps to Safe Schools reopening. 
uh, to get students and staff and visitors on our campus in a quick, efficient manner. So as the video shared through the Daily Pass, it's a web-based tool where all families and employees can schedule COVID-19 tests. You can do it on a cell phone, on an iPad, a desktop, uh, and when you, you schedule the COVID-19 test, you get the results back quickly. Also, another feature, when we're ready to bring students back, and of course, we don't have the date yet, but the other feature is that it will allow students and staff to do a daily health check, a daily health check at home prior to stepping foot on a campus. When they do that, health check and they make a commitment to healthy practices every day, wearing a mask, socially distanced, washing hands frequently, the daily pass will give them a QR code and the QR code will be used as students and staff enter our campus so it goes quickly. If you can go to the next slide, please. So when our students and staff do the daily pass checklist before they come to a campus or before they step foot through the entrance of a school, It'll give everybody this QR code. At every school entrance, we'll have employees that we're calling welcomers, that when they see that QR code, that means that a student or staff member has safe to come on campus. So for some of our schools, you know, hundreds of students, we wanna make sure we're doing it safely and we're doing it, you know, quickly and efficiently. If you go to the next slide, thank you so much. And so uh, families, um, the QR code, quick entrance, but left-hand slide, if a student doesn't have a cell phone, if they struggle with the cell phone, every school will have an entry line, we call it low tech. It's where we're gonna ask the students or staff to answer the health check questions. So it doesn't involve a device. So just know, Kindergarten through second grade students, those are young ones. Many of them might have to, we might have to do the check like you see in the left-hand side. Also community members, we wanted you to know any student or staff member that comes back on a campus when we're ready, we will conduct a temperature check before entry. And so you've seen this a lot out there in our community. Just know every school site will be doing the same thing and also for district offices. If you go to the next slide, please. I did want to share with the community, we've already tested over 375,000 students and employees COVID-19 testing. Uh, we have a, a great infrastructure, safe, efficient. As David mentioned, it's like seven to 10 minutes in and out. The reason I wanted to share this slide, and I want to draw your attention to the bottom right-hand uh, side of the slide, expanded COVID-19 testing includes household members. Community members and families, this is new. Our principals have shared this, but we wanted you to know. Now, anybody living in a household of a student, anybody under the roof of where a student lives is eligible to get COVID-19 testing. So please take advantage of it. The Daily Pass is live. It's easy to use. Please, we encourage you. Thank you so much. And if you can go to the next slide. Um, our goal, a safe return to school, it's we want to ensure that we have full-scale use of the daily pass and COVID-19 testing for all students and employees. And, you know, through superintendent's leadership over the last two years, we've reorganized how we support schools via school communities. So those daily pass checks on our district map, those represent the 42 communities of schools. Uh, where this great work is happening. And we have testing sites in all 42 of those sites. Thank you. If you go to the next slide. And I wanted to introduce a colleague of mine, uh, Pia Sadek-Hatmal. She is the Administrator of Instruction in Local District Northwest, uh, but Superintendent Butner has asked her to be by his side and our side for the last number of months as we're trying to quarterback us through these reopening plans. And Pia now is going to share with you our school site preparation plans. Pia, take it away. Great, thank you, Mr. Romero. 
So next slide, please. So I'm here to share a little bit about the diligent and careful planning that our school site teams led by principals and administrators and teachers around preparations at the school sites. So what you see here is a resource, resource called the Principal's Playbook in which it outlines very careful planning and steps that folks are taking around facilities preparation, developing an operational plan, looking at academic plans to support students, in addition to the family supports that are detailed by our school teams and also a training plan. If you go to the next slide, you'll see a sampling of this training plan that Superintendent Butner mentioned earlier. We're really looking at a comprehensive approach on ensuring that COVID-19 prevention is a priority. You'll see trainings designed for all employees, along with very specialized training for special members called the COVID-19 Compliance Task Force members, whose sole function is ensuring that COVID-19 prevention strategies are in place at all school sites. On the next slide, you'll see some pictures of what school sites have been doing across the district around preparing the school facilities. As mentioned earlier by Superintendent Butner, you'll see regular cleaning and sanitizing in classrooms, office spaces, the availability of hand sanitizers throughout campus. Um, you see that on the right side. You'll probably see those in a lot of our COVID-19 testing sites as well. Next slide. You also notice in this particular picture just how social distancing will look like in classrooms, both in an elementary format and also secondary. You'll see students facing the same direction, six feet apart, but most importantly, really emphasizing the use of that face mask for every single student on campus. And on the next slide, just a few reminders, you know, folks, we always receive questions, what can I do now to prepare? As was mentioned earlier, schedule that COVID-19 test. There's that website, dailypass.lausd, that you can log on to and schedule that um, COVID-19 test. Also, making sure that you practice wearing the face mask properly with your child. Um, you know, you'll see some images here of some students practicing wearing it, maintaining social distancing, and cannot stress the importance of washing your hands often. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand off to Dr. Baca. Thank you so much, Pia. Um, I'm doing my best to monitor the questions that are coming up, so I will attempt to address some of them in the next few slides as they come up in kind of big theme buckets. So as you go to the next one, um, we saw in advance and is coming through now really an update on small group instruction, specialized services. Of course, this relates to some recent announcements about the fact that we are continuing uh, to bargain in good faith with our labor partners. And I can say as someone who's close to that work that we have much more in common than, than separates us here. So we did have a self-imposed deadline of yesterday to get as much sorted out as possible. We're very close as we look at targeting small group instruction, we're of course, looking to be able to provide services for students with disabilities, in-person assessments, um, designated instructional services, related services, um, as well as small group instruction for our foster youth or youth experiencing homelessness to be, be able to, again, provide a safe space for learning, uh, for some supervised learning, tech support, et cetera, for our English learners to be able to provide some small group instruction for our early learners, some of our early education students, um, trying to work to find ways uh, to provide in-person instruction for these student groups, as well as resuming, <laughs> resuming in-person tutoring, um, both individually and small group. As soon as it's safe to do so, um, we do anticipate in the very near future having the details that folks are asking for here. I'll share, we've also had a lot of questions on the next slide, you'll see a summer, summer school, it should say, summer school this coming year. We recognize, we've heard the need to provide as much as possible. This will go beyond intervention, credit recovery, ELA math, all of that is important, but being able to provide 
a robust array of offerings, including some enrichment. Last summer, we learned so much, how to draw a minion, the fender, how to play a guitar, these exciting things. So this coming summer, we'll continue to be able to offer K through 12, both the, the meat and potatoes around what we need to catch up and also some exciting enrichment. We know this doesn't um, solve everything. It doesn't mitigate everything we've been going through. However, we've heard loud and clear that parents, families, students want this, and we look forward to being able to provide that this summer. Next, um, zeroing in on really all the different offerings. Everyone wants a timeline, we understand. Um, sticking with online learning, let me start here. This is where we're at now. Our job has been um, improving online learning, leveraging those lessons learned, better engaging students, getting attendance rates up, getting proficiency up, doing the very best we can with the tools we have now in distance learning. Um, next, preparing for that hybrid return, when we are able to offer in-person instruction, beginning, whether it's K2, K6, looking wider than that, we have been working all summer, all fall to be ready through some of the things you saw with preparing the facilities, but also our teachers. Hybrid learning really is based on the need for social distancing, stable cohorts of students, so you can sit one in every other seat. Typically, the schedules there um, involve um, every other day a week cohorts or an AM and PM. Again, we expect to have the detailed schedules folks want in the very near future, and we are preparing to be ready for as early as early spring right now, February. Again, as soon as the levels of COVID move in the right direction, we're ready for that hybrid return. We've been preparing again since spring. I get a lot of questions about, David, tell me, what will back to school look like for 2021, right? What will August look like? Will we have a full reopening? Our job is to prepare for all scenarios. We've had some families reach out when, when we are able to offer hybrid, when the students are able to come back, will I still have an online only option if I feel that's what meets the needs of my child, my family, et cetera? We're anticipating, yes, that will still be an option. And our job is to be as ready as we can possibly be for that full reopening of schools whenever we're able to do so. So I hope our presentation has shown some of the work we've been doing, everything within our control to be ready. And next, if you could go to the next slide, I just wanted to quickly say some of the questions in the chat were really speaking to mental health. And this is something, again, we know wellness is so important. We're, we're coming from that place of empathy and wanting to meet as many needs as possible. We do have a student and family wellness hotline. It's five days a week, eight to five, support with mental health, health insurance, food, housing, whatever may be needed. So for those in the chat who are talking about folks really struggling with mental health, we wanted to make sure we showed this number. We do have these supports. Um, with that, the final slide I'll share before turning it back over is, our goal is that safe return to school, doing everything we can to be as ready as possible, including meeting new needs um, in terms of vaccinations, a lot there. We're aiming to get our teachers to the front of the line, prioritize teachers, working with the county to be able to get it to as many adults in the community as possible. You saw committing to healthy behaviors, use of the daily pass, COVID testing, and making sure our school sites are ready. So with that, let me turn it back to our two mighty board members who are going to take us, I know, through more questions. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Pia. Um, I think we'll bring us all up on the screen now, including um, our superintendent, and we'll get to questions. And I want to, one, um, acknowledge how frustrating this all is for our parents and families who are joining, and we see that through your questions. Um, I know that despite the Herculean effort of a lot in our school system um, to prepare, that that doesn't necessarily answer the questions that are on your minds, which is when and what will it look like and why not now, and we will get to that now. Um, we have about 160 open questions right now, and I so appreciate folks' engagement. We have 957 participants. 
Um, so just know that we can't get to all of them, but we are gonna dive right now into um, uh, some of those questions that are coming up more frequently. Um, and I think we have, I think we're waiting for Austin maybe to hop back on. Um, if he can do that. Um, he's probably just trying to avoid questions that he wants David and Mike and Pia. No, Austin answers all questions um, and we appreciate him and his updates on Monday as well. So we will, um, you know, I think our first tranche of questions will be just on kind of the mechanisms of reopening and what are on parents' minds. And, you know, our families are hearing tons of contradictory information from the federal, state, city, county officials about when and how our schools might reopen. They've asked about the influence of different government agencies. I will acknowledge, and I was on the phone earlier today with our uh, state superintendent of public instruction, Tony Thurman, and the difficulty of an LA Unified uh, versus the New York, where New York, the city, the county, the school district are all the same. LA Unified, we have the city with its city council and mayor. We have the county board of supervisors, the county office of education at LAUSD. So there are a lot of uh, cross signals. And we know the state and county have guidelines that are often changing and contradictory, and that happened at least twice today. So superintendent, is the decision to go back to in-person instruction at the sole discretion of LA Unified or who are the, the players um, and why is this so complicated right now? Sure, it's the right question. I'm sure it's the question that of 960 people, 959 probably came to uh, hear and talk about. You mentioned two things, the when and the how. Uh, let, me, let me start with the how first, which is we're ready. How could be tomorrow? How could be a month from tomorrow? How could be two months from tomorrow? Uh, the question is the when. And the when is determined when and if we can meet the state standard for what constitutes a safe school environment. So I'll repeat a little bit of what Dr. Baca said, but it might have been quick for a few people. Uh, the standard was seven cases per 100,000 to consider reopening. At no time since March has the Los Angeles area met that standard. Uh, the governor adjusted that over the uh, holiday break to 28. That was adjusted a week later to 25. So let's assume 25 is the operative standard. Right now, Los Angeles is about three times the state's standard. That's the key to the front door. We don't hold that key. State and local public health authorities do. I think uh, Ms. Ortiz Franklin mentioned the disproportionate impact this pandemic is having on working families. And if there's one wish I had at the state, it would be to do more uh, to address that because that's the key to our front door. When and if, and I hope sometime soon, we cross that threshold, we'll be ready. The other piece, We'll be making sure that those who work in schools are vaccinated to make sure that we've got every teacher in every classroom supporting the students and their needs. And we've talked a little bit about the mental health support and other needs that will be uh, present in schools when we welcome students back. Uh, I wish I could tell you today there was something more we could do to influence that, but it is the COVID health of the communities that we serve right now that stands between us and the front door of school. When that's met, we'll be ready. I will be out front of school welcoming students back, smiling under my mask uh, and beginning a new day in Los Angeles Unified. And I hope that is sometime soon. Uh, as Mr. Melboyne said, it is challenging for us sometimes because of the differing levels of individuals who have a thought. It is very easy to say, we'd all like students back in schools. You know, raise your hand, who wouldn't? Uh, the challenge is to do it safely and the challenge is to do it within the regulatory constraints were presented by the state but let me just elaborate because I saw a comment in the chat. I want to answer very directly. Uh, the governor proposed during the same time this new 25 or 28 standard, uh, a package of dollars to help support school reopening, as well as technical assistance for those school districts who need it. We've done the technical assistance side. We're already providing COVID testing. We've already changed the air filtration system. So that's not particularly uh, of use to our schools right now. Uh, but unfortunately, what was proposed would be a step back from decades of progress in the state of California in making sure we provide funding to students in schools with the highest needs. What the governor proposed was those schools by February 1st that were meeting the standard and could submit an application uh, would receive incremental funding. Well, we told him on December 31st uh, and every day subsequently uh, that our schools won't meet that standard because our community doesn't meet the COVID standard. Uh, so we hope that's changed. 
uh, one of the struggles we have is those are just draft guidelines. The state legislature still has to adopt them. They are just holding their first hearings on them this week. So this is something that's happening in real time for all of us. And what we hope that comes in days, not weeks, from the governor and the state legislature is clarity. Give us a clear and consistent standard, help the community meet that health standard, and we'll be ready to do our part. Thanks, Superintendent. You know, that is confusing to hear so many different pieces of information from different levels of government. And I think one big question we've heard from a lot of families around that is requesting waivers for our youngest learners to come back on campus, maybe our students with disabilities. So can you share a little bit about um, our approach to uh, asking for a waiver or thinking about how to get our highest need kids back on campus first? Sure, it's our goal to have uh, those with highest needs back as soon as possible. To be clear, the county is not granting any waivers right now. We're under a stay here at home, safer at home, whatever the nomenclature used locally, even though the governor today announced the state as a whole is no longer issuing those, counties still are. And so in Los Angeles, we're still at the, I believe it's stay at home or safer at home. I, don't, I can't recall which is state and local. Uh, and that precludes waivers, that precludes small group, that precludes any extra support we would provide at a school right now uh, to small group or highest need students. As soon as we're able to, uh, we will want to, and we will do so. And maybe related, a lot of our families are asking about the vaccine and if that will be required to come back on campus, who gets it, what's our approach? Can you share a little bit about that? Sure, uh, I'll start with um, what we do know about the vaccine, what we don't know and, and how we think that translates to schools. Uh, we do know it's been proven safe and effective for adults. Uh, and we'd encourage any adult who has access to it to please uh, get vaccinated. It's the best way to keep yourself and your family safe. Uh, we do know that there is no vaccine proven safe and effective for children. Uh, we hope that will be the case. When that's the case, we expect it to become part of a normal school environment, just like the vaccination is for the measles or mumps or anything else we can do to keep a school environment safe. That is a ways down the road. So we imagine a scenario where the adults at a school are vaccinated and the children are not. Uh, and therefore we will maintain COVID protocols in schools for quite some time to come. Vaccination as it touches schools has two parts. First, we believe we can help make sure there is access, convenient access, trusted access for the communities we serve. Uh, I'll give you some context on the Christmas Eve, we served a million and a half meals. Nobody waited more than five or 10 minutes. Uh, we provided almost 400,000 COVID tests. Nobody waits more than five or 10 minutes. Uh, while the mass sites serve a purpose, uh, we believe to truly provide convenient and safe access to so many of the families we serve, it should be closer to the home. Uh, and I'll just take a, one of the communities we serve. It doesn't happen to be in BD4 or BD7, but I just know the numbers in my head. There are 22 schools, three drugstores, two fire stations, uh, and no stadium. Uh, I think the organization with 22 places in the community, which by design are right in the middle of where people live are a good place to provide vaccinations to all in the community, to our staff, to our students, to the families we serve, and no different than was done with the polio vaccine. So as a location, we want to support operationally. We've proven we can do it with meals, with COVID testing, and we do it again with vaccinations. We actually have licensed health clinics at schools that are licensed already to provide vaccinations. We just don't have the dose of the vaccine. Uh, as to when members of the community are made available or their opportunity to become vaccinated, that's above my pay grade. That's being set in Sacramento and more locally. Uh, we believe teachers will be part of the second wave. Um, all who work in schools, we'd like that to happen to make sure that our cafeteria workers and bus drivers and uh, those in classrooms with students uh, are as safe as possible and allow us to welcome students back. Uh, as it becomes available to families, we encourage them to go anywhere there is access, but we hope schools are part of that solution. Uh, and I expect it will be quite a number of months down the road before any serious conversation about students can happen until we know more about when it might be safe and effective if vaccines available for students. So to, um, oh, go ahead, David. Mine is just a slight follow-up to that. So right now, our latest information from LA County Department of Public Health puts uh, education and childcare as 1B tier one. So we're in 
1A right now through all the tiers. Next would be 1B tier one for vaccinations. Yeah. Hey, David, let me just, I, I think that, that, again, it goes back to clarity. Uh, those tierings are changing. Uh, so even 65 and older, we're actually not in the tiering. And so the governor seems to be adjusting those. We actually are advocating uh, publicly at the county board of supervisors tomorrow uh, to continue the work. You know, I, I'm as frustrated, I think, as probably many on this call. Uh, California right now is bringing up the rear in terms of the portion of vaccine received uh, that's actually in someone's shoulder. Uh, and we'd like to assist at schools and we'd like to see what we can do to make sure educators are vaccinated quickly so they're back in schools quickly. Who knew you never had to call someone in the second tier if it's just one A, C, D, E. But uh, two quick follow-ups on the vaccine and then I wanna talk about uh, labor because uh, I know that's on many parents' minds. Um, one, just because I know there were some misleading headlines in the last few weeks. So to crystallize what the superintendent said, children being vaccinated will not be a prerequisite or a condition precedent for schools reopening. Is that That's correct? That's correct. It is. Let, be clear. Uh, we expect to return with COVID protocols as soon as we can, as safely as can, when standards are met. We hope those who work in schools are vaccinated by then. Students will return not vaccinated because there is no vaccine proven safe and effective. Down the road, we expect health authorities to treat this the same way they would any other uh, tool at their disposal to keep a school community safe, but that's quite a ways down the road. Thank you, great. And um, we had some questions from families about, it's great that schools would be vaccine distribution centers, but will that slow the reopening of schools because you'll be pulled in different directions? So can you just talk about uh, that vaccinating, yeah, certainly vaccinating those in schools, I believe will accelerate. The vaccinations for the community will not impact one iota our ability to safely and quickly reopen schools. It's an and. We'll continue to provide a safety net in terms of meals where needed. We'll continue to provide COVID testing because that is an important and integral part of our return to school plans. Uh, and we'll, we will provide, we hope, uh, vaccinations right alongside. There's a further benefit in that we'll have better access to information because ultimately you'd want to know who on a school campus has been tested, hopefully everybody, who on a school campus has been vaccinated, hopefully some portion and that portion will grow over time. So it will not impact uh, the soonest possible reopening of schools if schools are able to assist in the vaccination process. Great. So switching or, you know, switching gears a little bit, but it is about vaccines to labor. And, you know, to clarify for our participants. I mean, the district works with numerous labor partners and we all but one we have agreements with on hybrid on return to school. And so kudos to the district and to our uh, bus drivers and principals and um, the you know folks who are working in food services and um, all of our employees. Um, we've also been pushing, as the superintendent just mentioned, to get our teachers and to get our uh, school staff vaccinated at the top of the line. Um, and I know a lot of you have asked questions about, well, today the teachers union UTLA put out a statement indicating that even with the vaccine, uh, that wouldn't be sufficient. Teachers won't go back to in-person instruction or that's what they're advocating. Um, and that I think strikes some people as odd if we're advocating for teachers to get vaccinated. So just what are, what are your thoughts, Superintendent, on um, kind of the conditions precedent for getting uh, students and faculty back and how vaccines will influence that? Sure. Again, I'll repeat, it's my big three. Lower the overall level of COVID. 75 three times is three times 25. Way too high. Not safe. And I wouldn't recommend anyone here who has a child to consider if our most recent testing of children in Boyle Heights in Bell Cudahy showed one in three children showing no symptoms, having no known exposure, testing positive for the virus. It's not safe for anyone to bring anyone back in that kind of setting. So we have to make sure that happens. We have to make sure there's a consistent standard and staff are vaccinated. I think there's also a little bit of semantics issues, Mr. Melboyne. Uh, I'm saying the same thing. A vaccine is not enough. If COVID levels are three times the state standard, COVID levels are three times the state standard. So while an individual uh, who works at a school may be vaccinated and themselves are protected, we still don't know. Scientists can't tell us whether they could still have the virus and bring it home to someone in their family. Uh, and we do know that the prevalence is still so high, there's a 
very high likelihood at these high levels that students might transmit it to each other and bring it home to their families. So uh, I don't know that necessarily the way that UTLA's comments were construed uh, don't give them the benefit of understanding what where we are currently. Uh, my hope, and I hope their hope and everyone in this call is 75 approaches 25. Those who work at schools are vaccinated and the state's made clear uh, that when standards are met, schools should be open. So we have a lot of problem solvers in our community and folks have been looking at beaches and hiking trails and thinking, well, LA Unified has a lot of outdoor space. To what extent are we thinking about outdoor learning? Uh, we, we incorporate that as part of our plans. Uh, some may recall when we, we were able to have small groups uh, on school campuses in the fall, uh, we started outside. Uh, so the first thing we did carefully, cautiously, was one-on-one -on -one and small group outside. Uh, and that's incorporated with uh, David or Mike at the time, they take you through the plans. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the way the state's approaching it, it is a standard. So it's 25, whether you're outside, inside, uh, or walking around the block. But incorporated in our plans to keep students as safe as possible is to utilize all of the space we have inside and outside to keep students and staff members apart. And so we need the space uh, to allow students to recreate and do other things. Uh, so we'll take advantage of every piece of space we have, uh, but it won't be opening outside before we can open inside unless the state changes their approach. Great. And, and sort of two questions around how we can collaboratively work together, given that so many of our families are great problem solvers. You know, in Board District 7, a lot of our families are struggling with hotspots and stable internet, not the 900 folks on this call tonight, hopefully. Um, but how are we working on closing the digital divide for students who don't have steady access to learning right now? And are there other ways you recommend folks on the call advocating alongside us to meet the needs of our communities? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, we had to quickly pivot to keep every student connected and learning, remain connected to their school community and learning. We didn't start in March with every student with a computer device. We didn't start with every student with appropriate uh, internet access. Uh, so we endeavored to make sure every student had a computer and we made arrangements uh, to be able to buy relatively cheaply internet access, high school internet access that we could provide to students who needed it for free. We did that back in March. Uh, the state about two months later looked at our agreement and said, well, you have the best agreement. Do you mind if we, the state, copy yours to offer to other school districts? So we have led and we've continued to make sure any student, including a family on this call, if your child needs a computer, let us know. If you can't afford or don't have internet access, call us and we'll try to solve it. Now where this conversation has to go next is this is the province of the Public Utility Commission, the state of California, the city of Los Angeles. They are the regulators of the providers. So I'm old enough to remember when I grew up, I had to dial the rotary dial phone and there was lifeline access. So anybody's home we went to, they had a phone. There was no hazard to have notes. Somehow we went to this wireless world high-speed internet world. And unfortunately we created hazard to have notes and that cannot continue to be the case. So our advocacy has to be at the city, county, state to say, you have the regulatory infrastructure. The providers uh, need to not only be told how to step up, but where to step up because they have the technical infrastructure. And if we went to any home in the Los Angeles area, an apartment, a residence, whatever it might be, whether it's Spectrum, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, they each have a map of their digital capabilities. They could tell you right now which of them is the best place to provide you with the best access. That's not the expertise we have. Uh, they should bring that expertise. And the state needs to provide ongoing funding so that we not only make sure students have access and their families have access today, but that when we come back to school, we maintain that connectivity because we found there are other benefits. Right now it's working. Right now we're trying to do the best we can with Zooms and all those things. And uh, you know, raise your hands who's had enough Zoom for today. Um, so, so we're doing the best, but when we go back, there are things that we've learned and are doing that we want to keep doing. We have 5,000 students right now taking guitar lessons online with free guitars provided by Fender. We want that to be every middle school student. We want to keep going with some of these things. So board member, I'd say the place our families could help us in advocacy is to say, what is the state, the county, the city doing to make sure the regulatory infrastructure is there? 
just like we had in the old days. Everybody has access and to make sure the funding is there so that it's not coming from a school budget to be able to provide it to a family for free who may need that. Um, so work to be done collectively. Uh, and my hope is, I know you and I have spoken, this is one of the things we're working on to try to put together a plan that the legislature might adopt as their own. So that as we look out two months, six months, uh, that the state has enacted a plan to make sure every family has the high speed internet access in their house, as is done in so many other countries around the world, should be done in our city. Thanks. And in the spirit of continued collaboration, we'll share our email addresses and social media to continue to hear families' input. But maybe from the superintendent's team, what's the best way to um, hear from families in an ongoing way as we reopen our campuses? Sure. Uh, David or Mike uh, may wish to add, uh, we have each of our principals, we know, are holding weekly uh, meetings, coffees with principals. I guess it's buy your own coffee at home and principal has his or her coffee wherever they are, but uh, we're still doing coffees with principals each week. That's a forum. Uh, as Mike mentioned, we have community of school administrators in each community uh, who are another place. Uh, certainly any local district superintendent or my office or Dr. Baca. But the best place to start is typically at your local school. Uh, the staff are trained there. They understand the community the best. And we're, my job, Mike's job, Dave's job, Pia's job is actually to support the local school and help them make sure the problem is solved. I don't know, Mike or Dave, if you wish to add, but best place to start typically is at the local school. If you have direct feedback, David will put a uh, uh, his address or someone's in the chat for some of the more broader policy questions. Sure, and, and superintendent and families, uh, yes, always the best place to start is at your school with your principal. That's the most efficient way to get support and to answer questions. There is a community of school administrator in every one of our 42 distinct communities. Uh, they have their websites. I'm sure you already know who that person is. It's one-stop shopping there. And then another layer is the local district office and we have local district superintendents like myself. So there's a lot of places to turn. Please do not hesitate. I did wanna share with the Daily Pass, we had a few questions. Um, we just met with all principals across the district and prepared them to share information on the daily pass just around the corner. Sit tight, it's coming just around the corner in principal town halls or coffee with the principals, though, so there'll be more on it. Parents, uh, teachers, staff, and students will have to go to the daily pass every day before coming on a campus to make sure they make a commitment to safe practices and to answer the safety check questions. But students and staff are not going to be COVID testing every day. We are going to ask students to be COVID tested one time before we reopen, whenever we reopen, and we're going to ask employees to be COVID-19 tested frequently. So there's still more to come on that. Let me, let me, Mike, just add, because uh, I, I don't want uh, families to think that we're, we're asking uh, uh, families with an eight-year-old to go out and buy them a cell phone. Uh, the, the idea is we've set up this system so that we have accurate information. We're making it easy to get people into a school quickly. Imagine the high school where we're trying to keep 10 or 12 students in a cohort so they don't spread the virus with others if one happens to have it. But if there's 100 kids waiting on the sidewalk to get into the school, our cohort's no longer 10 or 12, it's 100. So the idea is to provide for quick access we will always have, as Mike said, the paper pencil. So for those who don't have a device or forgot to log on. And for younger children, we expect their families to help bring them to school as they always do. And there's a printed, uh, just like an airplane ticket or, or just like a ticket to Dodger Stadium. If you don't have the device, you can have a printed uh, uh, QR code to take with you. So we have, we'll be able to accommodate any type of family situation and the circumstance and the age. Uh, but the idea with the technology, just imagine those 100 high schoolers on the sidewalk, we don't want 100 people in the same room. We want them quickly in, safely in, with an accurate record of where we stand on that. That's the purpose of this uh, information system. In addition, it supports scheduling the tests, as Mr. Romero said, weekly tests for everybody, students and staff, uh, making sure that those who have the opportunity to be vaccinated have taken advantage of it. Uh, and you'll see for those who haven't yet used it, once you take the test, the information comes back to you securely and safely. And if, God forbid, you happen to test positive, 
it tells you where to follow up with health authorities and others to make sure you get the mental, mental or uh, physical health support you need. Well, thank you, team. Thank you, families. A lot has been asked of all of us during this time. So it's great that we're collaborating, continuing the communication. I'll turn it over to Nick to close this out. Thank you, Tanya. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks for the folks who joined. I know that probably just prompted more questions than it answered. We have 251 unanswered questions. I will um, uh, just acknowledge that things are changing daily and, and daily is not, uh, they're changing hourly. Um, and so please look out for the superintendents, uh, Monday morning addresses and social media. You know, what I heard today from our superintendent and his team is that we're ready for in-person learning. And the question of course is when? Uh, and if we can say it's not today, uh, what day is appropriate? And I also heard that that's a decision that won't be made or dictated by a, a labor partner, but rather by a health entity. And so when we have conflicting advice from our county public health department and our state, that's why we are all speaking with one voice around we need that clarity so that we know when we can open those doors and the superintendent and all of us can be there smiling behind our masks. You can see it in our eyes or we'll be able to. So I wanna acknowledge it's, it's frustrating, but that's why I, we're working with our county and state partners. That's why I was talking to our superintendent of public instruction today. That's why the superintendent talks to the governor and his team and our supervisors to make sure that we can get those public health answers. LA Unified is many things. It's not a public health agency. We have the county public health department um, in LA. We have the state public health department. They're saying contradictory things and we need them to speak with one voice so that we can welcome your children back to our schools as soon as possible. Um, we're gonna share a few additional resources and reminders on some slides, uh, our district hotline phone numbers, uh, parent handbook, COVID testing, um, some of our community highlights. Um, just acknowledging we didn't get to any to as many questions as we would have liked. Thanks to our teams, BD7 and BD4, who are working behind the scenes to answer many of those questions. You can email us um, and we will uh, forward all your emails to David, Mike, Pia, and Austin to answer right away um, if we can't answer them ourselves. So um, I hope you'll also complete when you sign out of the Zoom an exit survey. It really does help us figure out how to make these more um, useful for you all. Uh, for those that speak Spanish, there's a survey that will be provided in the Zoom chat. Um, your feedback really is important for us as we plan future virtual events. I know my team is working on a future one in the next month or so around screen time. We're hearing from parents around both internet and online privacy and also how much screen time is inappropriate. Your students, your kids want to play uh, or games or communicate with friends after a long day of virtual learning, what's the right balance? So stay tuned for that. Um, and again, I just want to um, thank you all for your patience and resilience. I want to extend my condolences to those families who are going through hard times and who have lost a loved one. Um, I do think we see hope on the horizon, um, the reopening of schools, the vaccinating of our community around the corner. Um, and we're working as hard as we can to make that day uh, come as soon as possible. So thank you, Tanya. Thanks, BD7. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe and healthy and look forward to seeing everyone uh, in person soon.